Hello and welcome to the first edition of Second Contact, where we're going to look through some of the best games in the history of volleyball. My name is Liam Sketcher. I'm joined by the very well-known coach, Mark Levidu. How are you doing, Mark? I'm uh, I'm great, Sketch, and I'm really excited to be doing this to do um, stuff that I like to do and talk about volleyball and uh, the old games and the history of it all. It's uh, it's going to be it's going to be fun i hope well i hope so uh, so the idea is that we're uh, going to look at some of uh, the games from volleyball's past and and talk about why they're important games uh, what we can take out of it for the present and the future uh, and hopefully some other more notable elements uh, can you talk about uh, the game we're looking at today yeah well the the game that we're looking at today is the final of the 1992 Olympics. So it's uh, Brazil against the Netherlands. Uh, it was a, a really interesting tournament in that the, the big favourites coming into the tournament were uh, Italy, who lost to Netherlands in the quarterfinal, uh, were uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, who were... A few months earlier, USSR had won the previous European Championships and the World Cup in 91. Also Cuba, who were the vice world champions. And Brazil was considered an up-and-coming team um, with who might be a team of the future. The Netherlands were a team that looked like the late 80s. They were going to become the next great team, but hadn't done very well. And uh, in the sort of 1991 period, but they changed the coach uh, not long before the Olympics to uh, to try and get something back. So they brought back uh, the Ari Selinger, who had developed the team in the in the eighties uh, and developed all of the players that were uh, that we see in this game. And so it was a, a surprise final uh, that that both teams made it. And um, and if you look at the you know the nineties and how it developed, it was a a surprise winner as well. And as we talk about the game a little bit more, um, it's, a, uh, it's a really interesting, oh, it's a really interesting game from an interesting tournament. Can we talk a little bit about the team, some of the players involved and notably who's not involved? Uh, well, the, the, for the Dutch team, uh, we start there, the notable absentee, as you, as you say, is the, is the great uh, setter Peter Blonje, uh, who goes on to be in the next uh, 10 years the, the best setter in the world, wins the gold medal in 96, multiple Italian championships, etc. He sprained his ankle in the quarterfinal against Italy. And in fact, uh, this, the story goes that the Americans who were scouting that match, getting preparing for a semi final or and possible final actually put down their papers and stopped scouting because they they thought that the, that the Dutch had no chance from from that moment so he's the the main absentee uh, the the best uh, players or the most notable players from the Dutch team at that time were uh, Ron Sverver uh, the outside hitter who is is the the dominating especially in the absence of Blonjo the dominating figure in that team uh, and um, you know, they were known for being really big. So they had another receiver, Edwin Benner, who was two metres ten. Um, Jan Postema, the middle, who's two metres nine. So they were a really big team. On the Brazilian side, the uh, it was a, a really young team. Um, the oldest player was uh, Maurizio Lima, the setter, who is, you know, we're going to we'll talk about him a little bit and, and what he's doing and what he's trying to do. Uh, he played in the, the 88 Olympics, but most of the other guys uh, who are starting are, are in their early 20s or in the case of Negrau, sort of barely 20. Uh, so we see uh, Tunde and Giovanni as the outsides, Negrau as the opposite. And uh, maybe, uh, except, for, except for Lima, maybe the key player in the team is the um, universal player, Carlao. So we should probably move on to the game itself. Uh, and uh, it's a, a, a game of contrast a little bit between these two teams, but also 
Uh, the first impression I got from this game, watching particularly the offense, uh, is that there's some, uh, the phrase I used was proto-modern offense uh, being displayed by both teams, um, particularly Brazil. Uh, so when you were looking at the game, what, what jumped out at you as, uh, as the, the most notable part of uh, the way that these teams were playing? I think that you've nailed it exactly on the head when you call it uh, proto-modern volleyball. I remember uh, I watched the game whenever it was, well, whenever it was, 1992. Uh, so, <laughs> so I maybe only actually saw a set or so of it back then. Uh, it came up on YouTube two or three years ago and I watched five minutes and said, this is, this is volleyball from 2020. Well, what, what happened? I don't understand. Uh, and watching the whole thing and watching a few matches from that tournament, it's really, uh, it's, it's volleyball that somehow got lost in a way and, and didn't come back again for another 10 or so years when, uh, ironically, the, the next generation of uh, Brazilian players uh, brought it back, you know, for want of a better word. So they, they were playing really fast. They were focused on uh, the offense in position four with both of their receivers, especially with, uh, with uh, Giovanni, who is a proto Jiba. <laughs> Uh, and uh, except, uh, I think, a more athletic, more dynamic version of Jibo. In the, in the video, we can see uh, some of the actions where you see the fastball to position four and his, how high and fast he is above the net. It's, uh, it's really, the behind the court action is, is really impressive. And the other thing is their use of the opposite. So they were really... Uh, aggressive Lima Maurizio was jump setting from every position, which wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't universal at that time. Playing the long ball to position one with uh, actually with a variety of hitters uh, in position one, but especially with Negrao, obviously. And uh, it's, it really looks like a version of, of what we see now. So to explore a little bit more depth before we talk about the Dutch team, uh, uh, you talked about Giovanni as a, as a proto Jiba. Uh, what, what do you, well, you said, what jumps out at you when, when you see how dynamic and explosive he is, uh, how the offense evolved to use his talents. Uh, that, that was something that you mentioned before was, was a big step forward, a big difference. Uh, to how a lot of teams were playing at that point in time. I, I think about it or try to think about how I was playing volleyball at that time. And we used to talk about the, the setting up the combination play. So we'd have a first tempo and something close to the setter uh, or close to the first tempo as what we did to uh, occupy the block and then we talked about the position ball to position four as being the release ball so more or less the ball that you played when you didn't have the perfect reception or uh, maybe when you thought that the, the blockers were fully occupied with the the two spikers on the other side but here it's really especially when Giovanni's front but also but Negrao and um, at time uh, Negrao at times and uh, Tande, when they 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 are the the first point of the offense, and the ball is so fast that uh, the whatever they do with the other guys is a is a second reaction, and and the Dutch are whatever decision they make, it's always it's always late, and it's the block is so occupied with what's going on in position four that it really opens up everything else, which is what we see now, but what wasn't necessarily uh, as common back then. And the, the flip side of this is, uh, particularly with Negrao hitting uh, back row from position one, uh, that ball was uh, less fashionable than it is now, uh, but the tempo that they played that ball and how aggressive that set was, was uh, something that jumped out to me as exceptional for that period of time. I, I agree that there were certainly great opposites before then. Um, you know, Zorzi and Despania who played in 
in uh, 1990 final, which is a game that we'll uh, we'll look look at, I'm sure, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, they hit a lot, also from the back row, but the ball wasn't as fast. Um, Timmons probably in the the late 80s with the US team was hitting a ball that fast, but um, the the organisation of the offence around it was uh, was a little bit different. So. Uh, it's it's something different that we we're seeing for the first time, perhaps. Uh, absolutely, and uh, with with Lima, the third player that you mentioned before, uh, in terms of uh, technique, uh, both with hands and with feet, uh, he he showed a great variety of techniques and approaches to the ball, and his ability to be aggressive, uh, particularly on the long ball to the right side attack. Um, did did you see anything from him? technically, which, which stood out as uh, different or something that has been adopted later on by other setters? The thing that jumps out to me, and he wasn't the only person doing it at the time, but is his commitment to jump setting and accelerating the ball. So getting to uh, four and five metres from the net and not playing a high ball, but jump setting and getting the ball fast to... Uh, to position four for the for the most part there. If you go back to uh, again 1990 with Diago, the uh, the Cuban setter, he very rarely jump set. He would be taking the ball low with the focus on uh, what the blockers are doing close to him. So he's trying to uh, create some uh, hand, some delay to make the the middle end position opponent position four blocker uh, focused on different things where uh, Maurizio is the opposite to that. He's just taking it and saying, okay, you can't beat this ball to position four. As a, a very marked point of contrast uh, with the Dutch, both within their team and within the, the style of the game, uh, with Avatar Selinger uh, playing, he uh, I, I've heard him described as a bulldog. He's uh, not a tall guy, uh, but he's a ferocious competitor. Good. Uh, and in contrast to Blanger, who was uh, a very big setter at 205, 206. Yeah. Um, and, and the way that the game was being played. So maybe a chance now to talk about uh, the Dutch team uh, and some of their, their players uh, individually and the, the style of offence in contrast to the Brazilian team. They were not playing quite as fast. They had a, a little... Uh, with the ball to position four. So Sverva was their main attacker and really they looked to to open him up in whatever situation that was. So uh, he hit some pipes, which uh, which we, we hadn't talked about yet, but which is a feature of the game, uh, that he hit a few pipes, which was more or less unusual for the time. Uh, he would hit from position one or position five from the back row. Uh, and he was the, the main focus of their, their attack. One thing that, that struck me was that they were less mm, uh, focused on position one. So they had, uh, I think, four different guys hitting from position one at different times. Uh, and for that reason, I suspect, it wasn't, it wasn't as effective and it wasn't... Um, such a central part of of what they did, and uh, perhaps they they lacked at that time a, a pure opposite. The player that uh, that was playing that position was uh, was Ron uh, Baldry, and uh, he certainly wasn't a player like uh, like Negrau or as a what if like uh, his teammate Olafander Merlin. How would you describe the the flow of the game? Uh, there's uh, obviously ends up being a, a three-set victory to Brazil, uh, but the the story of the the game on paper is not exactly how it plays out in real life. Uh, what was what was your impression of the flow of of the contest? Well, I always felt like Brazil was the better team, and they always seemed to have the the upper hand. So uh, the first set, well, let's say, was more or less close, but they they won a few more points in the end. The second set was was really close until I think nine nine something like that. Um, 
they were the Brazil Brazilian team being really aggressive. They they did get blocked a couple of times. They they forced some actions, um, which is part and parcel of that that proto volleyball or proto modern volleyball that we talked about. Um, so they always felt like they had the the upper hand and that they were controlling the game. But from that midpoint of the the second set, really the Dutch they dropped their bundle, using to use an Australian expression. Uh, and really made made a bunch of errors, and and Ron Sverver ended up with uh, with thirty points. They weren't points at the time, but at a really high kill percentage. But uh, he made ten errors uh, by himself, and they the Dutch team made twenty one attack errors compared to nine by the Brazilians, which is um, at any in any game a, a really big difference. And the Dutch started the the third set well and led 5-1 at the at that point but even then never had the feeling that they were still making some errors in attack errors in transition when they had some chances and uh it still felt like the the Brazilian team were were controlling the game through their actions and uh you know once the the dam broke it, it really broke fast and it went from 1-5 uh, in favour of, of Netherlands to to being a 15-5 set, and um, at some moment, and I remember even at the time watching this back nearly 30 years ago, thinking uh, I think it would be better for everybody if this game just finished finished, and we could all um, you know we we didn't have to go go through it. A big part of what we want to do with this series is to talk about uh, why these games are important, uh, why people should take the time to go and watch them again. But part of this is uh, as a contrast to what we see in the game today. So it was, uh, what, what aspects of the game uh, do you think would fit in particularly well or seamlessly with, with how volleyball is played today? The most obvious thing that we've already talked about is the style of play of the Brazilians, especially. Um, and I want to say the pipe and the way that they they use the pipe is the is the most modern thing. Uh, with Maurizio and Giovanni, they were playing uh, the pipe off balls that were four or five meters from the net and and uh, fast attacks there. So from the from the technical part of it, that's the the, the first thing that's most uh, that's most modern that I can pick up watching the game. Something that stood out was uh, spin serve, jump servers, um, and uh, it were there's still majority of players had a standing float and usually trying to find themselves as close to the car park as they could when uh, <laughs> trying to uh, have the standing float serve. Uh, I, I noted in particular, uh, Sverva and uh, Negrau was sort of the battle of the two spin servers, but yeah. even between those two, you can see there's. Uh, a different philosophy or a different uh, approach to, to the, the jump serve. The the change of the net tape rule, I think, makes a big difference overall to the to the the power of the jump serve as a as a as a rule. So uh, the serving is is uh, there's a few guys who bang it, but it's not the same as it becomes later. Yeah, uh, you also mentioned uh, Von der Mullen. Uh, when he came on in the small parts, he, he he looked like he was another guy who was looking to to go for it on on his uh, jump serve. Uh, Van der Mullen is a we can say is a modern opposite um, who I think had the uh, without being inside the team and knowing exactly what they they're trying to do. Um, we for me, he's a, a guy that could have made a difference. Who seemed who from the 2020 uh, vantage point seems like a better fit, and that's perhaps is one of the things that uh, is the is dated that looks a little bit out of place. Is is on the Dutch side the absence of that pure opposite, and and overall a little bit the the lack of specialization, which uh, always is a little bit jarring uh, to watch teams who let. From a from a perspective, let players do things that they're they're not so good at, while other players are on the court who could be doing that thing uh, that thing better. So, um, 
you know, when we don't have the, the two receivers, when uh, the, the fourth, the second middle is hitting from the back row, different things like that uh, are a little bit uh, jarring from the 2020 vantage point. That leads it very nicely into our next question of uh, the, the parts of the game which stand out as, as different to, to how we watch the game, how the things around the game uh, that we see now in, in 2020. Uh, yeah, what, what, what other than uh, the specialization, what were some of the things that, that you saw that really harkened back to a different time? The... Uh, the speed of the game was one thing. Um, no technical timeouts. Uh, the the time between the rallies is shorter because there's no TV replays. There's no uh, challenge. So the, the speed of the game is a little bit better. Uh, one kind of funny thing, the first time you see it is, the, is when the players pull the little towels out of their shorts and wipe up the floor themselves because... Uh, we need to to get everything moving really fast, so uh, that's uh, an experiment that didn't that didn't last very long. But it was there for for one Olympics that we got to see. So uh, those are a couple of things that are unusual from uh, from our perspective now. Absolutely, guys, pulling a a towel that's half hanging out of a knee pad was. Uh, <laughs> was something that I hadn't seen before. One thing that, that also stood out for me was uh, the role of the coaches in these games uh, and how different it is from today. Uh, what, what can you say uh, as to, as someone who is a modern coach uh, and gets to exist by the modern rules, what, what stands out for you? Well, the, the rules at the time were that the coach was not allowed to be a part of the game, basically. So not only did he have to sit, and we can see in the video, sit uh, often nervously and distractedly, uh, uncomfortably, perhaps a better description, uh, but was actually not even allowed to communicate with the players on the court during the game. So the only impact they were, input they were allowed to have was uh, during timeouts. So uh, there's a lot of that. And, and for some reason, the production company has chosen... A, uh, a really nice angle looking up at the from side on at the at the coaches sitting there and watching the the different demeanor of the coaches is uh, is certainly interesting and um, perhaps their fashion choices too for sure there's uh, the the ongoing debate as to what is uh, the most aesthetically pleasing look for uh, for coaches so. I know that you have some thoughts on this. Uh, <laughs> the debate do, is only one. Make... <laughs> Everyone else uh, seems to be clear. Do do uh, do we want our coaches uh, looking more like uh, physical education teachers, or uh, there's one particular particular fashion faux pas in this game that uh, you find uh, exceptionally egregious? Oh, you're going to put this on me. <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, short sleeves and a tie is uh, is just not acceptable under any circumstances. <laughs> Correct. It's uh, it's one of those maybe signs of the time. Uh, I think the the look is maybe bus driver chic. Uh, is uh, not a is not one phrase you hear a lot. No, very very uh, seldom used phrase. Uh, but under the Olympics, the the rules with. Uh, being in team team wear is uh, a little bit restricting, so we'll give we'll give both teams a pass on this one for for the, the coaches' apparel. Uh, all right, but, all right, all right, just this one, okay? Uh, you, you touched on the the presentation of the game, the the version that uh, that I watched was from from Dutch television coverage. Uh, I think in terms of game presentation, the angles of the replays that they do get to show. Uh, really highlighted the athleticism and the yeah. dynamism of a lot of the guys. The the, the look of the game uh, is very similar to to a modern presentation, but as dictated by the tempo of play. Now we probably get to the the most important part of any review. Uh, yes. Absolutely, when uh, which team had the coolest uniform, and we can take some time to really explore this 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 element of the debate. <laughs> Uh, 
this is a it's actually a, a tough competition in this match in this match because the the Dutch team have the uh, the uh, lion the Dutch lion uh, as part of the their shirt design which was at the time uh, was not uh, was not very common to have something like that and is perhaps um, maybe it's a uh, the first version of the special printing process that everybody uses now that I've suddenly forgotten. Um, sublimation. Sublimation, that's it. Um, it's definitely not as cool as the uniform they had um, four years later, which was uh, definitely sublimated and was flames on their orange shirts, which was uh, perhaps the coolest uniform of all time. Um, but... I've since I'm a little kid, I've been a classicist and uh, and an Adidas guy, and it's pretty hard to beat the the three uh, the three stripes and the and the classic colours uh, and design of the the Adidas strip. So um, my vote is is for Brazil, uh, although I I do respect the, what the Dutch did with the uniforms around that time. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's, uh, if you look at other sports around that period of time, uh, the Dutch are remarkable in their restraint with some of the, the design choices. Uh, it could have been easy for them to go overboard with, uh, with the line design. Uh, I think it looks pretty clean. Uh, yeah. the, there's a nice contrast with the white shirt and the blue shorts. And, uh, I, I differ with you on the 96 and uh, was it 2000 very similar with the Dutch uh, by, the by 2000 thing. by 2000 they were going with uh, with something uh, simpler I think okay um, but the, the flame the flames were not for me uh, but uh, yeah I, I agree my vote goes with Brazil the bit that I thought was the coolest was the uh, the off center uh, number on the front of the shirt I think that was uh, <laughs> That was the coolest part. Uh, you probably that wouldn't fly today, but uh, definitely was not. A little, little bit of uh, flair, and another example of Adidas being able to sneak their their branding into uh, the <laughs> overall design of a of a uniform by getting the three stripes in. Let's uh, sneak it in. There's no, there's no. Con- it's not very subtle, but it's not uh, very subtle at all. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I. It, I do appreciate the, the Dutch design, but yeah, I think it's 2-0 for the Brazilians uh, today as it was uh, 3-0 on the court. We've been lucky enough to, to have a chance to talk uh, with people either directly involved in the game or people who have played with or been coached by people in the game. Uh, what are some of the, the notable uh, impressions that, that have come from people connected with this competition uh, the some of the the background that that we that we picked up on is that the two teams had a little history uh, in the the year or so before the before the tournament um, and that that uh, some of the Dutch players feel like they showed too much of how they wanted to play the game uh, when they played them sort of 12 or 18 months before. And that the Brazilians incorporated those things into their game and um, took them to another level. So the the uh, main example being the way that they were using the pipe or starting to use the pipe with uh, with Sverva, um, that then became the key part of the, the Brazilian game with uh, with Giovanni. So uh, that was one part of it. Um, there may or may not have been a little bad blood between the teams from. Uh, some games that happened earlier, but uh, perhaps you can see a couple of little moments uh, where there's some chatter under the net that uh, may have its origin um, a few months earlier. Uh, yes, uh, the guy to watch there in particular is uh, Evan Bene. Uh, apparently in one of the previous series, he'd uh, injured himself and there was differing opinions as to how that happened and who was responsible for it. Um, so I think he's a good guy to keep an eye on for that. Uh, one interesting fact that, that I came across uh, was particularly, you look at Ron's Verven in 92 and compared to 96 and the, the physicality in his game and how that changed. Uh, from what I've been told that the Dutch guys and, and Ron in particular had only really started lifting 
seriously in probably the, the two years beforehand. Uh, so in terms of physical development, uh, this was uh, a point of contrast for, for later on to, to look at uh, how physical sort of became in time and, and with the benefit of hindsight that how the little, little steps can be made from there. Uh, so this was really fascinating to hear from uh, a couple of guys who were actually part of the game uh, and that the, the steps that can be made between 92 and 96, which, were, which is obviously the next step that the, the Dutch team made. Within the game, there exist moments of uh, lightness and humour. Uh, can, you, can you explain what you, you find to be the, the most light or, or humorous moment in the game? Well, of course, in a, in a volleyball game, humour is also a matter of perspective. So there's a couple of moments uh, that, as, a, as an unattached fan, are humorous. Uh, the obvious one being the serve under the net from uh, history doesn't record exactly who served under the net, uh, only the ball going under the net. So I won't say the name out loud, but, uh, but we, can, we can deduce who it was. Um, and there is one particularly fine six pack uh, by Giovanni against a uh, against an unsuspecting Dutch defender that uh, was really um, equal parts impressive and uh, and amusing, except for of course for the the Dutch player at the time. Well, for the annals of history, whoever that Dutch server was is probably quite happy that the camera was uh, or the director chose to focus on the receiving side. <laughs> it's not that hard to deduce though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little thing called rotations. So, uh, they will be able to figure it out. Yeah. We've got to the end of the game. Uh, we know the result. Uh, we've seen what's happened. The unanswered questions. This is always the, the part of uh, looking back and trying to assess the, the, the quality and value of games. Uh, what is the big or what are the big what ifs that came from this game for you, Mark? when I watch this game, especially how it unfolds and how they play and in the context of the things that, that happen in the next years, the, the thing that I wonder is uh, why didn't Brazil win everything for the next 10 years? Because they had a young team. Maurizio was, uh, was even mid-20s. Kalau was older, uh, but he was still playing in 2000, so he could have continued to play. Uh, in 1993, a year later, they dominated World League. They, they were incredible, which is where I watched them play a lot was during that event. Just by chance, it happened to be on TV in Australia. Um, and so that's the, the what if for me is or, or what happened? Why is it that, that Brazil shone so brightly for such a short period of time and, and we didn't... Uh, see them again in at that level for another 10 years so the one story that uh, that I heard was that the that the coach at the time as a Roberto who's obviously one of the the most famous successful coaches in the world I think he has three gold medals now he was a, was very young at the time which we see uh, in the video and the success of the the team led to some Pat Riley uh, disease of me or disease of more, and uh, the the egos of the players might have become a little bit uh, uh, difficult to to manage, and that was the cause of uh, of the breakdown. Uh, Giovanni and Tande went and played beach volleyball at some point, uh, which probably also impacted the um, uh, the whole process. So. But it's, uh, it's pretty intriguing to me to think about what might have happened if that team had stayed together and continued to evolve um, for the next five or six years. What would have happened in 96? Uh, what the game might look like now if that team had had uh, another five years together playing um, at that level. Uh, the what if for me uh, is much to do with uh, something that happened in the tournament with the injury to Peter Blanger uh, and uh, Avital Selinger setting 
in uh, the last two games or two and a half games really of, of the tournament um, and the, the change in team dynamics that happened uh, with two very different players with different styles and different experiences. Uh, but does, does the Dutch team have a better chance uh, in this game? Does it change the outcome of the games against Cuba and Italy uh, leading into it? Uh, so this is a, a, you'll never know, but uh, for me to see the question is, is does this game play out differently with, without an injury to Bonger? Uh, it may not, but uh, obviously he was a guy who was towards the start of his run of one of the best players in the world. So uh, to be missing an Olympic final is, is a big game to miss, but uh, obviously Selinger had, uh, has the experience and the history already at that point of being a, a crucial part of the team. So uh, that's my what if for this game. This is probably the format that we will follow for a lot of these games, uh, which we look at in the, the near future. Uh, there's a, a few things, a few games that we've uh, made a little list of. Uh, Mark, would you like to touch on some potential highlights coming up? Well, they're all highlights because that's why we've chosen them. But uh, but games that we've been watching include the uh, 1990 World Championship final between Italy and Cuba, uh, the 1989 European Championship semi final, uh, which is uh, Sweden against the uh, Soviet Union, uh, the 1984 Olympic final may well. Uh, make an appearance and uh, there are quite a few other ones uh, that we're looking at up to and including uh, 2004, 2006 uh, where we might get a chance to compare the modern volleyball with proto-modern volleyball. Yeah, that's, uh, and anything else that uh, people who watch this, is there any games that they'd like to suggest for us to, to have a look at and uh, put through the second contact uh, filter? And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to look at some more of those in the near future. If you want to stay updated with uh, what comes next, uh, what games we're doing next, uh, and make sure that you hear all of our insights and hopefully, uh, hopefully enjoyable anecdotes that come in across our path, uh, make sure you like and subscribe. We're looking forward to what's coming up next uh, in our series. And hopefully you'll join us for the next installment of Second Contact. Peace, guys.